Hi, I'm Ron Watson, pastor of First Presbyterian Church here in partly cloudy, windy, and lovely Ocala, Florida. I'm glad you can worship with us today. Events coming up in the life of the church. March the 2nd is a Wednesday, Ash Wednesday. We'll be having our annual worship service at noon that day, which you're invited to attend. And we will hopefully have also something you could do online as well. You should look for that and count on it. We're also beginning our work with Pinnacle Associates, a church consulting firm out of South Carolina. And that work will begin with your participation. The first part will be a 40-day journey, a self-guided reflection and study on your part with Scripture, and that will be made available to the congregation soon. Uh, look for this in your newsletters for information on how you can participate in this study, which will begin in just two weeks. We will also be commissioning those who are going to be our leaders, part of the Way Forward Committee or Task Force, as you will. I'm glad you could worship with us today. Welcome to church.
Good morning. Our call to worship is the opening words of Psalm 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and the dry land which his hands have formed. Let us worship God together. confession of sin is a silent confession. I invite you to stop the recording as long as you need to pray and confess. Let's go to God. Amen. Friends, believe the remarkable good news of the gospel. In the name of Jesus, we are forgiven. Amen. Our first Bible reading is 1 Samuel 16, 14 to 23, when young David plays the liar for Saul. Our first Bible reading is 1 Samuel 16, 14 to 23, when young David plays the liar for King Saul. Now the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Saul's servants said to him, See, now an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord now command the servants who attend you to look for someone who is skillful in playing the liar. And when the evil spirit from God is upon you, he'll, he'll play it and you'll feel better. So Saul said to his servants, Provide me someone who can play well and Bring him to me. One of the young men answered, I've seen the son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who's skillful in playing the lyre, a, a man of valor, a warrior, prudent in speech, a man of good presence. And the Lord is with him. So Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me your son David, who's with the sheep. 
Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread, a skin of wine, and a, and a kid, and sent them by his son, David, to Saul. And David came to Saul and entered his service. Saul loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. Saul sent to Jesse, saying, let, let David remain in my service, for he's found favor in my sight. And whenever an evil spirit from God came upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand. And Saul would be relieved and feel better, and the evil spirit would depart from him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You are good, you are good When there's nothing good in me You are love, you are love On display for all to see You are light, you are light When the darkness closes in You are hope, you are hope you have covered all my sin You are peace, you are peace When my fear is crippling You are true, you are true Even in my wandering You are joy, you are joy You're the reason that I sing You are life, you are life in you death has lost its sting Oh, I'm running to your arms I'm running to your arms The riches of your love Will always be enough Nothing compares to your embrace Light of the world Good morning. Have you ever played tag with just one other person? What do you think? Is that a very fun game of tag? Maybe it's better than nothing, but if you just took turns tagging each other, it could be kind of boring. I think we could all agree that tag is more fun when more than two people play it 
because, they, because having more people changes the back and forth of only two people playing. I want you to keep in mind this idea of tag being more fun when there's more people playing it while we talk about today's scripture story. In today's story, we hear Jesus teach his disciples how to respond to their enemies. The lessons he gives them are very difficult things to do, and even just to think about. He tells them to love their enemies. He tells them not to judge their enemies. He tells them to give away their things to the people who are stealing from them. And finally, he tells them not to tag the other player when playing a two-person game of tag. Okay, you caught me. He didn't say that last thing, but he did say all the other things. But I do think this idea of tag being helpful in understanding what Jesus is saying. In a game of tag with two people, what does the it person want to do to the other person? That's right. They want to tag them. But then, what does the new it person want to do? They have to tag that person back. And it just goes back and forth, back and forth. When people do things to us that we think are unfair or mean, we often want to get back at them. But Jesus offers a different option. Jesus invites us to follow him. And when we choose to follow him, we learn from him how to receive God's love healing and mercy. And the more love, healing, and mercy we receive, the more of it we have to share with others, even those who are being unfair or mean to us, like our enemies. And that's the good news for today. Please bow your hand. Fold your hands and bow your head and pray with me. Thank you for Jesus, dear God. Thank you for Jesus, who shows us how to love our enemies and thank you for helping us to pay attention to you as we try to love our enemies. In your name we pray. Amen. Just a quick reminder, there is no youth group tonight, February 20th, due to the Marion County Public School three-day weekend. And we look forward to seeing you next weekend. Thank you.
Thank you for your support of First Presbyterian Church here in Ocala. The three ways you can support us, uh, first of all, you can always drop by the church office mail slot and make a donation that way. You can get our address from our website, fbcocala.org, or you can just go to the website and simply click on Give and Give Online. Thank you for your help. Let us pray. Eternal and gracious God, receive our gifts. Help us to be cheerful givers. Oh God, we know you love them. Help us to worship you, to serve you, and join you in ministry. In the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. I don't have a lot of prayer announcements this morning. Um, Biddy Kirk passed away. I think you all know that. Uh, she died about um, a week ago. The service will be in late April, and we'll have plenty of time to get that, that exact news out. Um, I don't know of other prayer concerns. Uh, in the, the past week, we've prayed for my daughter, Anne Louise, who was married. Here's a picture of her and I dancing with her um, new husband looking on. And the father-daughter dance was one of the joys of my life. So let's celebrate uh, fathers and daughters and families and uh, pray for families as we pray today. Um, often I pray a spontaneous prayer, but my favorite prayer book is the Scottish Book of Common Order, which recently was edited by David Bell, the Scots contemporary musician. And I don't know that he wrote this prayer, but um, uh, I want to do this. And I'm going to include a prayer for the Queen, which is written in the Scots prayer book. But uh, Elizabeth, the Queen of um, England, is celebrating 70 years on the throne. Uh, that's amazing. And um, let's pray. Loving God, we praise you. We praise you and thank you. And we know that you care for all your children and know each one and hear each prayer. You know each house and see each need. Give peace and love to those who call upon you and receive us into the kingdom of your light. Bless your church here and everywhere. Confirm, with, confirm your people in the faith of the gospel. Inspire them with love for your house, zeal for your service, and joy in the well-being of your kingdom. Bless your servant, Elizabeth, the queen. Govern the hearts and minds of the queen and her ministers and counselors. We pray not only for our ally, England, but we pray for America. We pray for our president, Joseph, for all who advise him. We pray for folks in Congress, for judges. We pray for the governor of our state, Ronald, and for those who advise him here in the Florida cabinet and in the legislature that's meeting in Tallahassee and continuing to meet. We pray for wisdom. Bless the whole world with peace. Kindle in our hearts, in the hearts of all people, true love of peace. Guide with your wisdom the leaders of nations. Bless with your comfort all who are in trouble or pain. Heal those who are sick. Support those who are dying. Console those who mourn. Supply the wants of those who are in need and be near to those whom we name in silence. Bless our homes, that love and joy may dwell there, and keep those who are absent from us within your protection and your love. We pray for new families like my daughter, Anne Louise, and Hunter, who have created a new family and We'll be creating a home together. I pray for all the families of our church. Um, hear these prayers, O oh Lord. Hear our um, prayer together as we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our gospel lesson this morning is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 6, beginning with verse 27. Hear the word of God. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. He also told them a parable. Can a blind person guide a blind person? Will not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully qualified will be like the teacher. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, friend, let me take out the speck in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. He is jealous for me. Love's like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind. are for me and oh how he loves us so oh how he loves us how he loves us so we are his portion and he's our prize drawn to Redemption by the grace in his eyes If grace is an ocean We're all sinking So heaven meets earth Like an unforeseen kiss And my heart turns violently Inside of my chest And I don't have time To maintain these regrets When I think about the way he loves us oh how he loves us oh how he loves us oh how he loves yeah he 
loves us Oh, how He loves us Oh, how He loves us Oh, how He loves Oh, how He loves us Oh, oh, how Lovability, or maybe another would be, some Christians are hard to love. For years I thought these words of our Lord, love your enemies, as a kind of words reserved for people who committed crimes or were against us in wars where we were obviously in the right. I think uh, back in the 1940s and 50s and even into the 60s and 70s, a lot of ministers like to preach about Hitler because he was the perfect enemy. Someone easy for us to say, that's what I'm talking about. That's what we shouldn't be. Now, I don't know. We seem to, at times, have visible and very predictable enemies in our world, but we see that the world is complicated as we get older and wiser. I also notice that people do not see only unknown people who were against them as their enemies, but they may have many known enemies, or many of these might be Christians, which gets me back to the problem about lovability, and Christians are hard to love. <laughs> Not you, of course. <laughs> Not you, the viewer. Uh, you're the easiest bunch of people I know to love that I've ever had the privilege of serving. I, I really mean that. And it's fairly easy for us to talk about loving strangers who are different from us, from different parts of the country, who, who speak different languages. We can, we can love these people in a way because they're so different, but, but loving people we really know I think is much more challenging. Honestly, you probably don't know many people who are not Christians, or at least people who are of a godly faith. Sure, you might find people who don't go to church, and, and we know there are plenty of those. We, we run into them all the time, and, and they're in our families. But people, some people who are Christians, uh, whether they attend church or not, or, or they watch our videos or not, or perhaps even well thought about in the community, can be our enemies. Let's face it, the world we live in is not a paradise, and, and we do suffer from conflicts with each other. Jesus knew that. We know that he wanted the Jewish people to love Samaritans and Gentiles and the like. That was loving your enemies. But we know there was plenty of conflict in the Jewish community to go around. Loving your enemies starts with loving people that you already know and perhaps have had a disagreement with in the past or, or, or maybe right now. Or, Maybe things are just tough between you. They could be people in church or neighbors. They could be down the street. Jesus told us how we are to treat these people we are well acquainted with, who at the very least are, are not our friends and perhaps are our enemies. We should seek the unlovable, forgive the unlovable, and reflect on our own lovability. Seek the unlovable. Help the enemy. Love. Do good. Lend. We got plenty of unlovable people around. And we might just call them our enemies. We can believe that we have no enemies, or at least we could certainly hope it, but it, it probably simply isn't true. A reporter was interviewing a, a gentleman who, on his 100th birthday, 
What are you most proud of? He asked the man. Well, I don't have an enemy in the world. Oh, what a beautiful thought, said the reporter. How inspirational. <laughs> to which the man replied, yep, I've outlived them all. Every last one of them. It's true. We have enemies. And we can make them in the strangest ways. Uh, I have an enemy in Savannah, Georgia, if they're still with us. Uh, I don't know of the man that well, but I know a little bit about him. It happened at the Walmart parking lot, the very epicenter of human drama and discourse. It was raining that day, and I was driving in circles looking for a place to park that was somewhere near the same zip code as the front of the store. Finally, a, a, a place opened up, and I saw someone backing out, and I waited for them to start their engine and drive away, but they took an awfully long time. Other cars behind me were not patient, particularly the driver that was right behind me in a Buick. He began to honk. Then it got worse. I was too close to this car for the man to back out. I put on my own reverse lights, hoping against hope that the Buick would let me back up another three feet to let the guy in front of me out. But the man behind me would not budge an inch. In frustration, I pulled forward. The car pulled out, and the man behind me in the Buick swiftly pulled in. He jumped out of the car and started swearing loudly enough for everyone in the parking lot to hear, including my son, who was then only six years old. When I finally got into the store, after walking some 10 feet, there was the man talking with three friends who I learned after some eavesdropping, I'm not proud of this story, were his fellow church members. Yes, my new enemy was a Christian. I could think of a lot of things I wanted to say, such as, I wonder how your church friends would like to know how you just swore like a sailor in front of a six-year-old, or do they teach parking space theft at your church? <laughs> I must say, I am not proud of what I did say, and I will tell you what I said. I said, that's a pretty Buick you have. It would be a shame if something ever happened to it. And I walked on. But recognizing me, <laughs> the man quickly excused himself from his church friends and ran back out into the rain. I'm sure that we have enemies because there are a lot of unlovable people in the world. And when Jesus tells us to seek them out, I'm also certain that Jesus would not approve of the way I sought out the man in the Buick. No, Jesus gives us difficult instructions. Love them, do good to them, lend them money, and, and don't expect it back. Don't avoid them, don't curse them. Seek them out and do good to them. That is much, much different than make them think you just keyed their car and infinitely more difficult. Second, forgive the unlovable. I can tell you that I didn't forgive the man in the Buick for a long time. I finally did, but it was years later and he wasn't around to hear it. But forgiveness is the cornerstone of our religion. It was forgiveness that drove Jesus to the cross. It was forgiveness for others that he asked for in his dying breath. And he pleaded to his father on behalf of the people that killed him. When you remove forgiveness from Christianity, what's left? And yet we would much rather get even with our debtors than forgive them. Late one summer evening in Broken Bow, Nebraska, a weary truck driver pulled his rig into an all-night truck stop. He was tired, hungry, and the waitress uh, had just served him when three rather tough-looking people came in, in leather, motorcycle types, and decided to give this man a hard time. Not only did they verbally abuse him, one grabbed the hamburger off of his plate and 
Another took a handful of his french fries, ate them right in front of him, and the third picked up his coffee and began to drink it. How did this trucker respond? How would you respond? Well, this trucker did not respond as you might expect. Instead, he calmly rose, picked up his check, walked to the front of the room, put the check and his money there and the cash on the cash register and, and went out the door. The waitress followed him, uh, picked up the check and the money and put it in the register and, and stood watching out the door as the big truck drove away out into the night. When she returned, one of the cyclists said to her, well, he's not much of a man, is he? She replied, I don't know about that, but he sure isn't much of a truck driver. He just ran over three motorcycles when he left the parking lot. The unlovable come to us in many forms, but most of them share one thing in common. They've done us wrong. And if it weren't for Jesus, it would be hard to come up for any reason for forgiving them. It seems quite unnatural to us. We'd much rather get revenge, seek retribution, or retaliate in some perfect and poetic way that would make us feel even, much like the not so good truck driver. I found eight words or phrases for retaliate uh, this was in the thesaurus, and it was a small one. <laughs> Is there another way? Is there some other way we can forgive those who do not deserve it? One writer tells a story about being in the car with their child, and the child exclaiming in the rain that as the windshield wipers went back and forth, that the, the rain was like sin, and the windshield wipers were going back and forth of God forgiving our sins. And... The parents said, well, what does it tell you that the rain keeps coming and the windshield wipers keep going? And the boy reportedly said, well, that we keep on sinning and God keeps on forgiving. I think it's a nice little illustration. So let us also forgive. Seek, forgive, and lastly, re reflect on our own lovability. Look for planks. I know of many people in the world who call the church full of hypocrites and I've always said they're right. Uh, we have to acknowledge that the church is certainly full of them because we need forgiveness. It wouldn't be a church if we already had it and had no longer any need of it. But having Jesus call us a hypocrite, that really stings, doesn't it? Why do you look at that speck in your brother's eye Pay no attention to the plank in your own, Jesus says. That log. How can you say to your brother, uh, let me take the speck out, when you've got this giant log in your own eye? We have to take that out first. And then Jesus says, you know, you're a hypocrite. It stings a little, surely. But Jesus has a point. We're not supposed to spend our lives filled with pointing out other people's mistakes. We're told not to judge, so we ourselves won't be judged. Jesus is asking us to reflect on our own lovability, to take an inventory of ourselves, start looking for those, those logs and, and planks. We see all these unlovable people who are covered in specks, but we forget to look for our own planks. Anyone hearing this story for the first time would understand the irony of not being able to see a plank <laughs> stuck in your own eye. We shouldn't be checking on other people's specs. We should instead be looking out for our own planks. We're just not good enough to judge other people, plain and simple. Christian author Max Licato puts it this way, we aren't good enough to judge can the hungry accuse the beggar? Can the sick mock the ill? Can the blind judge the deaf? In the same way, can the sinner condemn the sinner? Absolutely not. He goes on to say, be careful. 
that Peter who denies Jesus at tonight's fire may proclaim him with fire at tomorrow's Pentecost. The Samson who is blind and weak today may use his final strength to level the pillars of godlessness. A stuttering shepherd in this generation may be the mighty Moses of the next. Don't call Noah a fool. You may be asking him for a lift. I like that. We're not good enough to judge others, but Jesus is good enough for us to judge ourselves. We're not good enough to judge others, but Jesus is good enough for us to judge ourselves. We have the standard. We have the measuring tape. When we look into the mirror, when we reflect, what do we see? Seek the unlovable. Forgive the unlovable. Reflect on our own lovability. Here's three, three thoughts you can take with yourself today and maybe meditate on this week. But I want to say one more thing because I kept going back and forth of calling this lovability and some Christians are hard to love. That title might have worked. I could have even said some Christians are, are difficult to love, but I was thinking about the word hard because of another meaning. Some Christians are hard to love. Their hearts become hardened to it because they have been wronged, because the world has not treated them fairly in their eyes, because they were right but no one else thought so, because they got the short end of a stick. They have become hardened to love. My word is this, let us not be hardened to love, or rather let us warm up to it with the forgiveness that God gave us. We'll be better Christians for it, and, and maybe, just maybe, we'll be more lovable ourselves. Amen. Let us affirm what we believe using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May the loving power of God, which raised Jesus to new life, strengthen you in hope, enrich you with his love, and fill you with joy in the faith.
Amen. Go in peace.